You said you wanted to raise a legal issue. What's the legal issue? The legal issue is what, how, how is the state allowed to coach the You're people assuming the they state? spoke to them and coached them. It's obvious. I'm not, I'm not stupid. Well, I disagree with that, sir. We review when Waukesha Parade defendant Darrell Brooks, who represented himself, thought he knew the law, but got it so wrong. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. No one said being a lawyer was easy, or maybe I should say trying to be a lawyer is not so easy. And you know who may be thinking about that right now? Darrell Brooks Jr. This is the man who was just found guilty of 76 criminal charges for driving a red SUV into a group of holiday parade goers out in Waukesha, Wisconsin, back in November of 2021 killing six people, injuring dozens of others. This was a defendant who decided to fire his lawyers and actually represent himself. And despite all of the arguments that he tried to make, none of it worked for him. And the jury found him guilty across the board. So what we decided to do was to actually go through some of the key moments when Brooks thought that he knew the law, but got it so wrong. And listen, you don't go to three years of law school and pass the bar exam for nothing. As an attorney myself, let me tell you, this is a complicated practice, everybody. So where to start? I think the best place to start, and I, you might have guessed it, subject matter jurisdiction. Are we going to address subject matter jurisdiction? The written decision that I previously entered is what I will stand on. I'm not going to address it any that, further. Yes. Can we address subject matter jurisdiction? It still has to be proven for the record. I decline to do so. Is, it, is that including verified proof that you have subject matter jurisdiction? Because it has yet to be verified or proven. Mr. Brooks, you keep making that statement, but it's a misstatement of the requirements in the law. So it doesn't um, have to be proven? You are going to get a written decision. That's how I'm addressing this. And then I'm going to have the jury brought out and just providing courtesy copies to the parties as I uh, had an opportunity to finalize that over the break. I uh, set for value and return for value this document. Thank you for noting that. All right, bring the jury out. State has its next witness, I presume, ready yes. to go? Yep. All right, when the jury's brought out, you may call the witness. Is that verified proof that you have subject matter jurisdiction? The decision and order speaks for itself, sir. Is it verified proof that you have it? Sir? Yeah. I believe it answers your questions. I, I don't believe Unequivocally. so. Unequivocally. There's no ver verified proof proven yet. Yeah, it's the same thing. There's no verified proof if, if we're in common law or admiralty law. What, what court is this? Sir, I believe your answers will be in that decision and order. I don't believe so. Well, have you read it yet? I don't have to. Many times during the course of this trial, Darrell Brooks brought up the issue of subject matter jurisdiction. Now, this is basically whether a court has the power and authority to hear a case. Now, the reason seemingly he kept bringing this up is because Brooks identifies as a sovereign citizen. This is someone who doesn't believe that they're under the jurisdiction of the U.S. government, that they're exempt from certain laws. Here is the problem for Darrell Brooks. This is a non-issue. It's a non-issue because all you have to do is read the judge's order on this. First, she explains that the Wisconsin Constitution says that Wisconsin circuit courts like this one have jurisdiction over civil or criminal matters within the entire state. And here, a criminal complaint was filed with the court, a preliminary hearing found probable cause against Darrell Brooks, and all of the criminal charges are in fact valid. And his whole point about this being common law or Admiralty law makes absolutely no sense. This is a criminal court case. What would have made sense if it's, is if he was facing, let's say, federal charges and this was being tried in a state court, then that could be an issue that he could bring up. But that's not happening here. All right. We move on to another time that Brooks thought he knew the law, and that was when he talked about his constitutional right. Uh, not if I'm not allowed to face my accuser, Your Honor. My accuser in this matter would be the state of Wisconsin. And with all Sir, due I respect. I believe your Sixth Amendment rights in that regard have been complied with. Um, I'm requesting uh, a written judicial fact, finding of fact and 
conclusion of law on this issue um, for the grounds that I just stated. Um, it, it was seen based on the Sixth Amendment that I'm not being awarded the chance to face my accuser, which I should be awarded that based on the Sixth Amendment. If I'm not able to face my accuser, then how can the claim even stand? How can how can a claim be brought against my client if I'm not able to face the accuser? Okay, so Brooks is actually correct on one hand. The Sixth Amendment does guarantee the accused the right to be confronted with the witnesses against them. And he's also correct that under Wisconsin law, the plaintiff in this case is in fact the state of Wisconsin as they are bringing the complaint against him. But Darrell Brooks' problem is that his rights are not being violated. He has a right to confront witnesses, but he tried to subpoena the state of Wisconsin to testify, and that is impossible. He can't call the state of Wisconsin to the stand because the state of Wisconsin is an entity. It's not a person. They're not a witness. Now, Brooks seemed to argue that, well, okay, the plaintiff is an entity. It's not a person. Remember the sovereign citizen citizen thing? That these charges are somehow invalid. Totally wrong. The Wisconsin legislature supports the state bringing this action. So he can cross-examine any of the state's witnesses, but he has no right nor ability to call the state of Wisconsin or ask any questions about that. Now, this actually does lead me into another example of how Brooks got the law wrong, and that's when during his questioning of witnesses, the prosecution would object to what he was asking, and then he would immediately shout out, grounds, grounds, grounds. Do you even know the state of Wisconsin? Objection. Grounds. Grounds. Sustained. So it will be also fair to state that you are, are not an injured party in this matter, correct? Objection. Asked and answered. Grounds. Um, sustained. Are you aware what a plaintiff is? Objection. Relevant. Grounds. Sustained. Next question. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor. Next question, Mr. Brown. Okay. First of all. It's sustain, not substain. And second, often during the trial, he would yell grounds multiple times, even as the reason for the objection is stated very clearly by the prosecution and acknowledged by the judge. Third, I should mention, he's under no duty, no legal requirement to yell out grounds every time there's something that happens, every time there's an objection. He doesn't have to do that. He can provide an answer to the state's objection, but he has no obligation to yell out grounds. So if anybody's watching that, you don't do that in a, in a typical trial. And it's up to the judge to determine whether to allow the question or not. And if the judge sustains an objection, she herself is under no obligation to explain her reasoning any further, particularly because a further explanation could actually hurt Brooks's case. In fact, here's Judge Darrow explaining it to Brooks why she won't go further explaining the objections from either the state or Brooks himself. To specifically address the repeated request by Mr. Brooks for the court to state the grounds, sir, I am not legally required to do that. Those are legal determinations uh, that if you feel there is an error later on, you can address on appeal if you are convicted. I have been answering many of them uh, at your request, but I may not do that at all times. In fact, you're asking me to provide that explanation and really highlight for the jury um, the court's opinion on relevance. That's why we don't state that. There's an objection, it's a party makes it, states the grounds. Uh, sometimes I ask the opposing party um, for their position. Um, sometimes I do not. Many times it's very self-evident. Either the objections are baseless. Many of the hearsay objections are baseless. Um, your objection to hearsay is it's not hearsay. Uh, so that's why to me they're self-evident. I say sustained and we go forward. So you need to be aware, sir, that when you ask for the grounds, you're asking me to state a legal conclusion in front of the jury. Now, as we've mentioned before, Brooks was highly combative and disruptive with the court, so much so that Judge Darrow had to actually kick Brooks out of court, and he was placed in an adjoining courtroom with a monitor and audio system so he could hear and see and communicate when necessary. And by law, a defendant does have a right to be in court during a criminal trial, but 
Judge Darrow did have the legal authority to remove Brooks from the court during trial proceedings, at least temporarily when he was acting up. And anyone who followed this trial will know that the Supreme Court case of Illinois versus Allen was cited multiple times. And something to note here, it is true that that Supreme Court case was about a disruptive defendant who was removed from court, but he was actually represented by appointed counsel who could argue the case while he wasn't there. And I know people will look at that and say, well, then it doesn't apply here because Brooks is also acting as his own defense attorney. I would argue that let's say you had a disruptive defense attorney, the same thing could happen. That attorney could be kicked out of court. So I don't really think that's a, a strong argument. But there was one arg there was one point to talk about, and that is when Brooks got it really wrong. And he got it really wrong when he refused to answer the court's questions uh, about whether he wanted to testify. He just wouldn't respond. And the court interpreted that lack of a response as a forfeiture of his right to testify. So in other words, the court said he gave that right up. He can't testify. Now, Brooks argued that he couldn't hear what was being said because he was in the adjoining courtroom when he was being asked these questions, even though I should mention the evidence showed there was the audio levels were completely high and he could hear everything. Anyway, listen to what he says about why his uh, rights are violated. You're trying to coerce me into violating my right to remain silent. How can you, how can you, how can you coerce me into my right to remain silent? So you're not going to protect my constitutional rights. Because I didn't answer nothing that you uh, was trying to ask me before when I had the headphones on. And you can't make a decision for me. You can't do that. You're violating my constitutional rights. Sir, if you'd like to testify, then you need to simply go through the colloquy with this court, which I've given you three opportunities I, to do, and you have asking, decided not to. When I know, you can't tell me what I decided to do because I didn't decide to do or not do anything. So, yes, it is a defendant's choice to testify. It is a defendant's right to testify. No one can make that decision except the defendant himself or herself. But this constitutional right is not absolute. The judge wasn't coercing Brooks to testify. She was simply asking him what he wanted to do. She was ordering him to answer. She has to know one way or another. He can't just hold it up by not answering. And his refusal to answer whether he wanted to testify or not is interpreted as a, his silence is interpreted as giving up that right. Now, while I could go into multiple other examples where Brooks misunderstood or misstated the law, there is one last big one we have to talk about, and that is when it came time to presenting a closing argument to the jury. You see, Brooks wanted to argue, and I should say over the objection of the prosecution and order of the court, did in fact try to argue jury nullification. If I should be allowed to, then if that's the case, then I should be allowed to tell the jury what they need to know, which is the truth. They have the power. They have the power to nullify laws. They don't agree you are with absolutely them. not allowed to tell the jury that. There's a jury instruction that I will have ready to go if you even attempt to raise the issue of jury nullification, oh, so, sir. You have so, absolutely so. no right to raise that. That is oh, clear I can, I can, law. I can raise. I can raise what I want to raise. You should be informed that you have the power to nullify any law that you don't agree with. Objection. Move to strike the statement. Sustain. Objection. I will strike from the record the last statement made by the defendant. The jury which will is, disregard it. Which is clearly what I've been saying. I believe that not only is it fair, but it's essential that you be privy to all knowledge not knowledge that certain people feel that you should hear and shouldn't hear disguised under the color of law. No, 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 no. He does not have the right to argue jury nullification. Let me make that clear because jury nullification is when a jury decides a case not based on the facts of the law, but for some other reason. Maybe it's based on politics or their emotions. This is absolutely prohibited. They are not supposed to do that. And you cannot advocate that a jury do that. Jury, I know that the prosecution may have proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt, but just ignore it and find me not guilty. Not gonna happen. 
And like I said, despite all of his efforts and seeming knowledge of the law, it didn't work, and he was convicted nonetheless. And thanks so much, everybody, for joining us here on Sidebar. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.